Good day, crime talk aficionados. Let's get straight to the docket first. That scumbag Adam Montgomery, he's going to be sentenced tomorrow. A mom of four was stabbed to death while on a date. Uh, and Alabama approves the second nitrogen hypoxia execution. Things got a little stormy yesterday in uh, New York City. And uh, decriminalization, the great drug experiment, well, it doesn't work. And British Columbia wants it to stop. Now, uh, we also have a story of a lawyer that was shot in Houston trying to calm down an angry customer at guess where? McDonald's and then our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. All right, lawyer, lawyer, lawyer. Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't, like if you do, leave me a comment below, and make sure you hit that little bell so that you get notifications of when we go live or put up new content. All right, yes, casual day. No court, no way I was going to court today. We dressed casual, got in here super early, even got a haircut. We've been so efficient today and even fired a couple of clients. Yes, that's what it is. If you wanna be unreasonable and I don't care how much money you're paying me, go do it yourself. Thank you very much. One of these days, yeah, there's some days you just don't wanna piss off your attorney. Let's just put it that way. All right, um, and the other thing that really kind of upset me is when I go to get my haircut, I go to my barber. Now Clint is my barber, been going to Clint since I was a little wee lad, right? He was like 86 years old, and he's been in the same building for 60 years as of this year. And he had somebody come into his building yesterday and threaten him because he said, no, you're not going to uh, plug in your phone, Mr. Homeless Man, in my shop because, well, you're smelly. And they threatened him, and he had to be uh, basically, well, the, he ran away before the police got there, as I understand it. But the point is, who goes around threatening 86-year-old men? I just don't get it, ladies and gentlemen. I don't get it. Irritates the heck out of me. And don't mess with my barber. And, and man, if I get that case, probably won't. But if I did, I wouldn't take it. Don't go threatening my barber. Oof. All right, let's get to it. All right, first on the docket, open the record for May 8th, 2024. So prosecutors tomorrow anticipate uh, sending Adam Montgomery to prison for up to 56 years, which basically is a life sentence for him. And that uh, sentencing is scheduled for tomorrow. Now, as you may recall, back in February, a New Hampshire jury found Adam uh, Montgomery guilty of all charges related to the death of his five-year-old daughter, Harmony Montgomery. You know, when he kills her, puts her in a duffel bag, moves her from place to place, probably stuffs her down a drain. Yeah, that kind of scumbag, Adam Montgomery. Anyway, after two days of deliberations, the jury uh, convicted him of second-degree murder, falsifying physical evidence and abuse of a corpse, as well as a little witness tampering thrown in as well. Now, the judge, as you may recall, allowed Mr. Montgomery not to show up to court so he didn't have to see and confront and hear all the bad evidence against him to make it sound like, well, what he is, is a horrible human being. Well, the judge has ordered him because the statute requires there in Old New Hampshire that he be present for sentencing. Can't refuse this one. Order the drag order. We mentioned, hey, judge, that guy should be in court. I understand. I mean, frankly, it's the critical stage of the proceedings. He should be there in open court to hear it. And so he doesn't have the opportunity to say, oh, I didn't really waive it. I didn't really appreciate and understand it. I want a new trial. Mark my words, that is what he'll do. May not do it tomorrow, may not do it next week, but he'll do it like in five years. He'll say, well, my attorney didn't explain that to me and I want a new trial. Mark my words. And then the bottom feeders of the uh, criminal defense pool, yeah, the post-conviction attorneys, those are the ones. Uh, will come in and uh, try to say that uh, he just didn't understand and appreciate it. If he had been there, he would have been able to testify. Mark my words. Next on the docket, if you knew where you were going to die, would you go? Jarrett Haskell Davis is charged with murder, possession of a weapon, uh, 
during a violent crime and unlawful possession of a firearm by a person convicted of a felony offense. Third degree arson and desecration of human remains. He's accused of killing the girlfriend, Megan Bodiford, who was last seen back on April 25th there in Denmark, South Dakota, which is apparently about 60 miles south of Columbia, South Carolina. But before she went missing, she sent a disturbing text message to a friend, and I quote, If you don't hear from me in 30 minutes, he killed me. He has a gun. Now, I'm certainly not blaming her for obviously getting killed by her scumbag boyfriend. And he's given, obviously, the presumption of innocence. And, you know, he's accused of killing her and putting her in a car and burning the car and burning her. Um, but, you know, it doesn't look good for him. Let's be honest, right? Why? Why would you go there? Anyway, as noted, the uh, Bamberg County Sheriff's Office there in South Carolina found a burned out car with human remains that were later identified to Miss Bonaford. The Sheriff's Office uh, requested that uh, SLED, our favorite people from SLED, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, who did a good job in the uh, Alec Murdoch case, they actually did. Um, well, they, they arrested Mr. Davis on, uh, on Friday. What can I tell you? Next, a mother of four was stabbed while going on a date. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, obviously we know before the story even gets started that this person did not go to crimetalksearch.com and sign up for that background subscription service. And listen, nobody wants anybody to die. It is a dangerous world out there, ladies and gentlemen. Take it from a criminal defense attorney that deals with dangerous, bad people on a frequent basis. Be afraid. Be cautious. Be aware of your surroundings, ladies and gentlemen. One way you do that is you go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for that background subscription service. You can do as many background searches as you want. And if somebody is coming into your life, you check them out, right? People spend more time checking out a car that they're going to buy online than they do the people they're going to date. And it's getting them killed. Crimetalksearch.com. All right, back to our story. So the uh, suspect uh, was arrested on a uh, count of murder after a mother of four was stabbed to death in southern Louisiana uh, Saturday afternoon. Now, when the police responded to a report of a stabbing just about 2.30 uh, p.m. on April 27th, they found the car of Carol Allen. She lives in New Orleans. And guess where she was? In the backseat of the car with multiple stab wounds in her. Well, needless to say, Miss Allen was transported to the local hospital, but it was a little too late and she passed away. Guess who the suspect is? Take a look at this guy, Christopher Jerome Wilson. Now I know it's a mugshot, not his best look. Yeah, if I saw that guy, I'd probably say, we should probably go to crimetalksearch.com. Um, he was arrested and um, obviously he's been charged in connection with the killing. Apparently investigators found that Wilson and Allen were talking throughout the day of her death. The two had planned the date and they had met in a local city. Now during their time together, apparently uh, Wilson attacked Allen in an attempt to steal her car. He then proceeded to stab her multiple times before fleeing on foot. Now fast forward to May 1st at about 6 p.m. at night, and uh, police dispatch receives a call saying that a bicyclist has a flat tire and wanted some help and he's out on the interstate. Anyway, the officers arrived to help the man, the bicyclist with a flat tire, and they took Mr. Wilson into custody once learning that he was wanted. Wilson was charged with one count of first degree murder, armed robbery with a knife. In the past, he's faced charges of domestic abuse, battery, and um, a sundry of other charges. So, like I said, Somebody checks somebody out. They say, oh, look, somebody has a domestic abuse on their record. Gee, I wonder if that's going to be a good match. Hmm, what should I do? Should I go on the date? Oh, I'm sure he's changed. People change for the better. Yeah, check him out, ladies and gentlemen. Check him out. CrimeTalkSearch.com. Sorry for the shameless plug in there, but it just seems so appropriate. Next on the docket. Hey, maybe it's just one of those days, but... Alabama has approved the second nitrogen hypoxia execution. Good thing, bad thing. I don't know. Um, anyway, the Alabama Supreme Court tells us that they have authorized the nitrogen hypoxia execution of Alan Eugene Miller. 
obviously setting the stage to have at least four executions in Alabama this year. Now, Mr. Miller's execution would be the second carried out using nitrogen gas, according to the Attorney General's office. Now, let's see if Mr. Miller deserves it. Mr. Miller is now 59 years old, and he was convicted of killing not one, not two, but three people back in 1999 during a little workplace shooting at a, um, a suburban area in uh, Birmingham, uh, Alabama. Anyway, this is Mr. Miller's uh, second date with the executioner. He was originally set to die by lethal injection back in September of 2022, but the staff couldn't gain access to his veins for the IV lines before his uh, death warrant expired. So I guess he was saved by the bell or lack of veins. Anyway, Mr. Miller said that during the aborted 2022 lethal injection attempt, prison staff poked him with needles for over an hour as they tried to find a vein and at one point left him hanging vertically as he lay strapped to a gurney, according to court filings. Anyway, the attorney general's office decides um, which condemned inmates uh, are to be executed. And then the Supreme Court authorizes the uh, governor to set the execution date. Now, the state of Alabama is prepared to carry out the execution of Mr. Miller's sentence by means of nitrogen hypoxia, according to the attorney general, adding that Mr. Miller has been on death row now since the year 2000. So 24 years the state has been waiting to execute Mr. Miller. When the estate originally tried to execute Mr. Miller back in 2022, uh, death warrants in Alabama were in effect for only 24 hours. Now they're in effect for 30 hours. Anyway, uh, Mr. Miller had filed a federal lawsuit seeking to bar the use of nitrogen hypoxia as the method of execution, with the suit claiming it amounts to cruel and unusual punishment, which is obviously barred by the Eighth Amendment to the United States Constitution. So. We'll have to wait and see. The Supreme Court in Alabama says, go forth, Attorney General, do great things. Somehow, I think the United States Supreme Court may be asked to weigh in on Mr. Miller's case. We'll see what they decide to do. Anyway, Mr. Miller, a, a former delivery truck driver, was convicted in the fatal workplace shooting of Lee Holbrooks, Scott Yancey, and Terry Jarvis. And the prosecutors um, said that Miller killed Holbrooks and Yancey at one business and then drove to another location to shoot uh, Miss Jarvis. Each uh, man was shot multiple times. Now, there was testimony at trial that indicated Miller believed the men were spreading rumors about him. Rumors. Anyway, the jury convicted Mr. Miller after just 20 minutes of deliberation. And then they ultimately recommended the death sentence, which the judge agreed to impose. Now, with the nitrogen hypoxia, the uh, wonders of modern science, the uh, condemned person breathes pure nitrogen through a mask and the nitrogen displaces the oxygen in the lungs and bam, there you go, one dead prisoner. Now for those history buffs out there, back in January of this year, Kenneth Eugene Smith became the first person in the nation to be executed by this method and the execution is, was carried out in the death chamber at the William C. Hullman Correctional Facility at Atmore. Now, in the weeks before the execution, the Attorney General's office wrote in court filings that the inmate would lose consciousness in a matter of seconds and die in a matter of minutes. Smith um, apparently uh, withdrew and uh, shook on the gurney for some four minutes before appearing to lose consciousness. His uh, convulsions shook the gurney several times and he appeared to gasp for air and uh, wither for about two minutes uh, more after he appeared to lose consciousness before he apparently stopped breathing. The morning after execution, uh, the attorney general described the execution as pretty much textbook and said the state was ready to carry out some more nitrogen hypoxia executions. Two other inmates have uh, had their execution dates set. First is Jamie Ray Mills. He's set to be executed sometime during the 30 hour time period uh, from midnight, May 30th uh, at 6 a.m. through uh, May 31st. Mr. Mills was convicted of three counts of capital murder back in August of 2007 after the jury recommended the death penalty by an 11 to 1 vote. Trial judge took the jury's recommendation and sentenced Mills to death. And then in June of 2004, Mills bludgeoned an 87-year-old man, Floyd Hill, to death while stealing items from Mr. Hill's storage shed. Mills also beat Mr. Hill's wife, who was 72 at the time. She died days later in the hospital. 
And then we have Keith Edmund Gavin. He's set to be executed during that 30-hour window beginning on July 18th through July 19th. Obviously, Alabama has uh, approved of this method, and I don't see the Supreme Court stopping it. I know it's a controversial subject, but hey, let me know what you think. Nitrogen hypoxia, is it better or worse than the old gas chamber, electric chair? Maybe a good old fashioned execution, I don't know. Um, but it's not going away. And so I guess you're gonna have to do to make it as painless as possible. But as the Supreme Court has said, it doesn't have to be painless. So let me know what you think. Next, things got a little stormy in New York yesterday. We brought you some of the story yesterday, but definitely a little more uh, to discuss. We mentioned yesterday the judge allowed Miss Daniels to get into great tea dale as to the sexual exploits that uh, she alleges took place between herself, the former porn star, and the former president. The judge, over objection, uh, let her describe how Mr. Trump apparently came out in pajamas and told him to go change and then maybe spanked him with a, a magazine where he was on the cover of it. And then they got into uh, whether it was unprotected sex or not unprotected sex. And of course, the defense was objecting. And then the judge was like, why weren't you objecting? And the defense said, we did, judge. You just allowed it. But then the judge realizing that, oh, my goodness, maybe I maybe allowed just a little too much evidence in, told the prosecution, hey, let's tone it down a bit. This is a family program. Well, not really, because the judge didn't allow it to be televised. Anyway, on cross-examination, uh, Ms. Daniels basically told her that, uh, told the world that she hates Donald Trump. She'll never pay him. But where things got really tricky, and this has got like mistrial written all over it, at least at the appellate court level, I don't know. Maybe the judge in the Stormy Daniels case uh, where Donald Trump is charged with falsifying business records and the judge allowed in all this risque stuff about a sexual encounter. How does that go to prove or disprove the crime of an accounting issue in a falsification of documents case? It doesn't. Judge, have you ever heard of that guy named Harvey Weinstein, former movie mogul? Yeah, that's right. And that was a sex assault case. And the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. Ridiculous. Somebody should just declare a mistrial now. Put everyone out of our misery. I watched a lot of this information yesterday throughout the spectrum of commentators, those from the far left to the far right. And one thing is clear. Uh, even the far left people said that Miss Daniels was a terrible witness. It probably should have been a mistrial. And um, the prosecution should be losing this case. We'll see if the jury uh, bites at this evidence or not. Wait and see. More to come, no doubt. Next, the great experiment as it relates to decriminalization of drugs. Well, some people have tried it, are figuring out that it doesn't work. Today, we go to Canada because the people in British Columbia are saying that public drug use is illegal in all public spaces now, because apparently it didn't quite work out so great for them. So the great experiment, public drug use became illegal again in British Columbia. That's in Canada. Very lovely. Nice temperatures. Really, really wonderful area. Been there a couple of times. Anyway, so British Columbia, uh, like I said, it became illegal in British Columbia once again um, after the uh, federal government granted the province the request to scale back its drug decriminalization pilot program. Now, the change represents a major policy uh, sidestep from the provincial uh, governments uh, more than a year into their three-year pilot program with Ottawa that claims that they were tackling the deadly overdose crisis uh, that was taking place. So anyway, back in April of 26, uh, the uh, province announced that it had asked the Health Canada to amend the exemption, allowing the decriminalization of small amounts of drugs, such as, you know, those everyday drugs that are harmless, heroin, fentanyl, cocaine, and methamphetamine. Why, you say? Well, following some widespread concern from the public, nurses, and police, 
around consumption in public. The government officials wanted to ban the use of the drugs in spaces such as hospitals and parks. Hmm. When police are called to a scene where illegal uh, drug use is taking place, they have will now have the ability to compel that person to leave the area, seize the drugs when necessary, or arrest that person if required. Uh, government officials, however, have said that decriminalization was never about providing uh, space for unfettered public drug use. The intention was to ensure that people felt that they should not be afraid to reach out for help whenever they were using the drug and whether they were using it at home or whether they're using it in some other place. Anyway, the government officials acknowledge that there are lessons to be learned from the British Columbia pilot program, such as ensuring there are health services in places to help people who are struggling and ensuring that the police have the tools need necessary to manage public safety. Possession, though, in a private residence still remains decriminalized. Okay, I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I am probably one of the biggest libertarians out there. Um, you should be able to do what you want to do, just don't harm anybody else. And that harm in everybody else is, in fact, well, the public as a whole um, when it comes to drugs. Let me just get straight and simple. Drugs are poison. Just say no. I know it sounds cliche, like you've heard that one before, but I'm telling you, you'd never had a drug problem if you didn't start taking drugs in the first place, all right? And I get it, some people get addicted, but it is not compassion where you let people do their drugs in an open space uh, and allow them basically to become zombies out on the street. That is not compassion, that is enabling them. You get more of what you tolerate. Yes, if these people wanna get help, we can do that. We want to get you the help. However, if you start breaking into people's cars to get money to go get those drugs, guess what? Now you gotta now you gotta pay the piper. Okay. Now you're violating somebody else's property rights by taking their stuff, and that's what the government's job is to do: to protect everybody's rights against other people violating them, and basically make sure that your stuff doesn't get taken because then that's a crime. Decriminalize open drug market concepts have never worked. They always fail. They will continue to fail because you get more of what you tolerate, ladies and gentlemen. Get them help. But helping them get the drugs is not helping them. That's enabling them. Next, a lawyer has been shot and killed in Houston trying to calm down an angry customer at McDonald's. I, I, I don't even know what to say, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know, maybe it's just the attitude I got today. I don't know, but I just feel a little fired up. And it's random, senseless stuff like this that just irritates me, right? I know, oh, Scott, you're a criminal defense attorney. Yeah, and I'll protect your rights so that you get due process. But I'm just getting sick and tired of this nonsense where these people are harming and killing other people for no reason whatsoever. And over McDonald's food, are you serious? So a Texas attorney was shot by an irate McDonald's customer after he tried to calm down the irate customer and told him stop shouting at the staff about his order. Jeffrey Limmer, that was the attorney, stepped in when the customer started shouting at the McDonald's. Now this took place in Houston Saturday night about 6 p.m. Limmer then tried to calm the man down as they fought outside the store. The angry man went to his car, pulled out a gun, and shot Mr. Limmer twice. The gunman then fled the scene in an early 2000 blue Ford pickup, and that individual has not yet been identified. And yes, now he is going to go to prison when he's found and given due process and convicted for the rest of his life, ladies and gentlemen, over a dispute about an order. What are people thinking, okay? And let's just get straight to the point, right? There's rape, murder, violent crime, and everything else. Everything else could be, usually be resolved. But when you commit violent crime, guess what? You're going to prison. That's just the way it is. And the reason that is is because you, as a violent person, cannot be trusted to engage properly with the rest of the civilized human world. And if you want to act like an animal, you're going to be caged like an an animal. You're going to be caged until you get so old that you cannot harm anybody else. 
That is the general premise as it relates to our criminal justice system. You commit violent crime, a certain point, maybe you just can't be rehabilitated. Maybe you're just a danger. Or if we got to let you out, you got to be so old you can't harm anybody, ladies and gentlemen. And it just get tired of seeing this stuff over and over again. Next, a family that does time together stays together. A woman is in custody on suspicion of trying to hire someone to kill witnesses after her son allegedly stabbed a man to death at a five-year-old's birthday party. Police allege that Josefina Cardona Cardona agreed to pay an undercover agent to carry out the alleged killing and kill two cooperating witnesses in her son's case. Now, Cardona Cardona faces two counts of solicitation to commit murder, and uh, she will also be deported after she serves her lengthy prison sentence. Now, Ms. Cardona Cardona's son, Manuel Marcos Cardona, stabbed a 19-year-old man back in 2022 when he was 14 years old at a five-year-old's birthday party, ladies and gentlemen. Apparently, two adults got into a fight at the birthday party, and the victim tried to intervene and stop the physical altercation. Mr. Cardona then stabbed the victim several times, and Cardona and his parents allegedly continued to beat on the victim. The man, unfortunately, died the following day. Now, Cardona and his family tried to escape uh, to North Carolina back in June of 2022, but this sheriff caught them as they were trying to make their way out of town. Anyway, Cardona was charged as an adult, even though he was only 14 at the time, pled guilty to second-degree murder, and got 15 years in prison. He could have faced life, but he took the plea deal instead. What do we say, ladies and gentlemen? Murder for hire situations. The other guy is always a cop or a snitch willing to make his life a little better by snitching on you. So general rule of thumb, let's not solicit to kill anyone. That's your free legal advice for the day. Next, our dumb criminal of the day. A globe-trotting jewelry thief has been arrested. Yarong Wan was arrested in uh, Queens, New York on Friday after he allegedly stole rings from Cartier and Tiffany stores in Manhattan. The arrest ended Wan's year-long criminal career, which took him halfway around the globe from South Korea to Beverly Hills. And his string of thefts began in September of 2018 when he stole a $330,000 diamond ring from a Tiffany store in Seoul. And um, last December, he allegedly stole a 48,000 diamond ring and a $10,000 watch from a Cartier store in Beverly Hills. Now, Mr. Wan struck again this March, stealing a $255,000 diamond ring from Tiffany's. And um, the uh, court filings allege that he managed to switch the diamond ring with another band without the uh, shop assistant noticing after he entered the store about 3 p.m. back on March 4th. He asked the woman behind the counter about several jewelry pieces. The assistant then laid out some of the pieces, and Mr. Wan allegedly picked up the $255,000 ring, looked it over before leaving the store, and guess what? Only the ring he had handed back to the assistant was not the same one that the employee had handed to him. Or was it really? Hmm. Anyway, Mr. Wan had replaced the diamond ring with a counterfeit cubic zirconia stone mounted on 18 karat white gold. Well, investigators, what were they able to do? That's right, watch the video footage. That's right, from the day, and they saw the defendant examine the original ring, a natural diamond mounted on an engraved platinum, then allegedly slip it into his palm, sleight of hand, before unloading the fake one. Store workers said they photographed the fake uh, ring the following day and noticed it did not have any engravings or hallmarks. Anyway, Mr. Wan allegedly pulled off a similar trick at a Cartier store in New York eight days later. That's when he walked in about 1.30 in the afternoon, asked to look at two engagement rings and a couple of watches. And according to uh, court filings, the employee handed him the diamond ring and then got distracted. And then Mr. Wan allegedly handed back one of the rings but slipped the other, valued about 25 grand, into his pocket before leaving. He then went to Miami where he allegedly stole a $16,000 watch from Cartier. Anyway, Mr. Uh, Juan also stole two watches worth a combined $17,000 from Hermes in a mall in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Now, in the Long Island case, investigators say that Mr. Juan was browsing the watches when he 
slid a uh, Chopard watch into his left jacket pocket, and then he strolled past the register and out the door. Uh, when he was arrested, Mr. Wan allegedly had three of the watches that he stole in Manhattan and New Jersey, as well as the fake stones he used to swap with legitimate pieces. Now, he has pled not guilty, and by God, we are going to give our dumb criminal of the day the presumption of innocence. He uh, has an upcoming arraignment, and we'll probably continue to follow that and uh, see how that dumb criminal does. Mr. Wan, such talent, but yet you use it for evil. You are our dumb criminal of the day, sir. Congratulations. All right, that's all we have for you. Thanks for watching. Hopefully I wasn't a little too fired up, but hey, every now and then you just gotta you just gotta let it be. Anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk. And remember, yes, the Constitution does matter. Mm-hmm.